I wanted to bring what we know about COVID-19 into this uh, melange, especially at the end of the Bronze Age where we have a collapse. And it's not so much what that I'm going to be talking about COVID-19, but just the idea of plague and viral um, epidemic and um, in general. Um, I've been studying the collapse now for about 10 years in connection with my project in Israel, looking at the Philistines and their identities. And if they could have come from Crete or Greece or um, parts more mixed up as part of the um, infamous, infamous Sea Peoples. The term Sea Peoples is kind of a modern term. Um, it's like saying Europe. Europe doesn't really tell me. If you say to me, you're going to Europe, I'm not really going to know very well where you're actually going. So it's the same thing with the Sea Peoples. It's a collective name to re refer to a bunch of tribal groups that traveled around by sea. And they were probably a combination of warriors, uh, rowers, people that um, maybe they wanted to escape the palace systems for one reason or another. And as they moved through the sea, they'd plunder sites. And as their numbers grew, they could collect more ships. And um, plague is often uh, given as a possibility for collapse. But it was one I always felt um, difficult to accept because a plague, if everybody's sick, they're not going to be able to be running around and destroying things. But COVID-19 gave me a chance to take a slightly more nuanced look at this. And also, it's like not everything collapses. Many cities are destroyed, but not everything is. It's a much more complex situation. And it's also... Uh, well presented in the new reprint of Eric Klein's book, 1177 BCE. It's thought what influenced this sort of uh, piratical destruction throughout the Mediterranean was the appearance of a new sword. And that sword is the now two cut and thrust sword that you see on the top of the slide. And it's a very efficient bronze cut and, cut and thrust sword with two tangs. And it's thought that the invention of this sword is what led to the invention of iron as something to counteract its um, potential. Um, we all know that many great technical strides are made through military, um, ne the need for military gains, and the Bronze Age wasn't so different. Now, it wasn't sure originally where this sword originated from, but then spread very quickly. It seems now to have originated in Italy in the 14th century and spread throughout the Aegean and Anatolia. Um, there are only 17 examples of it in Greece, and we have to assume that it was either carried on by somebody else or that it was melted down because metals were very, very valuable. Next slide. I got it. Um, so the topics I'm going to cover briefly are um, just a brief overview of the Mycenaeans, for those of you who don't know uh, who they were, um, some of the brief theories that have been given for collapse. There really is no yet one theory for collapse, although I prefer my pirate theory. Um, we're going to talk about piracy, populism, migrants, and globalization. I'm also going to talk a bit about the ancient view of plague and plague symbolism. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of hard evidence for plague, but we do have a lot of indirect evidence, for example, in the, in the form of plague deities, which I'll say more about, and also desertions. And I'm also gonna talk about the um, effects or the social roles that plagues and pandemics can play on um, habitation areas. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a timeline to give you an overview of the period that I work in, um, in Aegean Greece, which is my major field, although I look beyond Greece to try to understand it better. Um, but the time periods outlined in red are the times I'm going to be focusing on today. And this is the late Helladic 3A and 3B periods. <clears throat> 
and going into 3C, which marks the period of the destruction of the palace, palaces and um, the appearance of migrants um, that were probably pirates that were settling around the region. Next slide, please. This is just to give you a quick geographic overview of the region under discussion um, with the principal Mycenaean sites on the mainland, particularly in the Argolid, where you have uh, Tiryns and Medea and um, Mycenae. Athens would have been a palace site, Gla up in Boeotia and Thebes, Pylos on the west, and on Crete, would, Hanya and Knossos would have remained important sites. And then in Anatolia, there is a city known as Miletus, which was ancient Milawanda, which began as a Minoan colony and was later taken over by um, later taken over by the Mycenaeans. Next slide, please. This is just to give the brief uh, characteristics of what a Mycenaean palace is. The Mycenaean palaces were built about a hundred years after the Minoan palace structures were destroyed. And if you've been to the Minoan palaces or studied them all, you'll notice that their focal point is a central court around which all the labyrinthine layout groups of rooms are organized. In contrast, the central focus of a Mycenaean palace is a hall. So the hall takes the place of the court. And within this court, you have a monumental hearth that would be decorated um, multiple times with painted plaster designs. And it also sat on a painted floor and um, the ceiling around it was supported by four wooden fluted columns. And often what you have there is a throne in placement for a king. And unlike the Minoans where we don't know how they ruled themselves, we do know the Mycenaean hierarchy and I'll say a bit about that in a moment. But in any case, you have these mega round palaces decorated with Mycenaean style frescoes. You have a lot of feasting pottery that took the form of a kylix, which is like a, a sort of a shallow champagne cup. Um, the Mycenaeans undertook administration using a writing system known as Linear B, and it's used to write a very early form of Greek we call Mycenaean Greek. Um, this writing system was borrowed from the Minoan Linear A script, um, but the Minoan Linear A script was used to write a different language. You can think of it in the way that we use the same alphabetic script today, but it's used to write many different languages, English, French, Italian, German, and maybe with some diacritical marks thrown in. So we had Mycenaean writing. Uh, there was also Mycenaean religion, and that seems to be practiced in buildings set out and below the palaces. Most Mycenaean people were built in chamber tombs. Those are tombs that would, would be cut into the rock. And then the elites were buried in what we call tholos tombs. The word tholo mean, tholos means round in Greek. And um, some of these were more monumental than others. And these tend to be where the elites were buried. Um, and uh, we won't look at all of them because your eyes will glaze over, but we'll look at the treasury of Atreus, which represents the apex of Tholos tomb technology. And I can't read what is below Tholos tomb because there's a bar covering my, um, I'm almost afraid to, I can't move it. So I'm just gonna let it stay, but I'm, I'm sure you can read what's there. Large scale building programs, actually. Large scale building programs, there you go. Um, next slide, please. And this is just to give you an idea of the Mycenaean palace style. This is a palace at Mycenae. It's on, it's on top of an Acropolis and it was heavily fortified. It's not as well preserved inside as the Pylos Palace. A lot of it's worn away. You can see that where the hearth is. And in fact, um, part of it um, to the left corner actually fell off the mountain. They did something interesting in this one, though, that you don't get in the others that have the painted plaster floors. They actually had some gypsum paving stones that they brought over from Crete so they can imagine themselves walking on the Minoans who they had um, basically conquered. And when you're looking at on the right is a linear B tablet. 
that could be held in the hand and have writing on it. Um, below are these Kylix cups that I talked about in terms of for drinking uh, ceremonies and rituals. And they change subtly over time in terms of the decoration might become more schematized, a little more natural. It might have three, uh, three motifs on it, then changes to one. And these uh, changes in the motif rendering or how we date them. And then what you're looking at in the lower right-hand corner is a reconstruction by an artist, um, one of the Dijongs of the um, inside of the palace at Pylos. And it shows it very grand with um, two griffins and lions. Um, however, only one griffin was ever detected in the excavation, so it may be a little overdone. But this gives you a sense of what the Mycenaean palaces look like. And I would mention again their text, whereas the Minoans actually had ritual and religious texts, Mycenaean texts were almost entirely used for um, bureaucracy and administration. You have deities mentioned in the text, but they're mentioned in terms of receiving guests or gifts from the people or from the priesthood. Next slide, please. Okay, I mentioned a Mycenaean hierarchy, and here you can see um, a fresco, a shield painted in fresco technique. Um, this technique is borrowed from the Minoans, but this is the shield itself dates to the Mycenaean era. And it's interesting for our purposes because this type of ox hide shield in a figure of eight style is mentioned in the Iliad. So it's something that um, Homer or the Homeric heroes or people making up the um, myths would have known about. Anyway, we get from the Linear B tablets the complete Mycenaean hi hierarchy. The Wanox or king, uh, the Wanocteron or the palace, a person called the Lawagatos, um, who is the leader of the people. This person was thought to be kind of mysterious until just recently. And one of our former Melbourne students went to Texas and wrote her PhD on it, which makes quite an interesting read. She sees him as like a cultural minister who helps outsiders, that is migrants and slaves, eliminate. And it's interesting because part of what you get with globalization are flows of different things, and I'll come out to that. Um, but the word lawa means flow. So you would get flows of outsiders coming in and it was the job of the Wagatas to help them settle in. Then you have the Basileus, who, which later becomes the title of the king in the later periods. Um, but in Mycenaean era, he's a feudal lord. And then you have the Hecates or the followers and the Teleste or the landholders. And they all contribute to the system and make it happen. Next slide, please. We get a little bit of information about Mycen Mycenaean religion from the Linear B offering tablets. They don't really tell us much about what deities did, but we do learn of their existence. And we learn of some that we didn't think appeared until much later with the um, classical era. So we have Dewi, which is to Zeus, Atena, which is Athena, Atamito, which is Artemis, Imaatu, which is Hermes, Poseidayo, which is Poseidon, Potnia, which means lady, uh, Dupuriotoyo, which is the labyrinth. And so if you're going to give one bottle of honey to the lady of the labyrinth, that would be one jar of honey, Dapuritoyo, Potnia. And that's just to give you an example. And the statuette on the right is a wheel-made goddess statuette. Well, they think she's a goddess. Um, she stands about 50 centimeters high, and she was found at um, the temple, the Mycenaean temple on the island of Philocopy. And more recently, there's been a bit of argument about her as to whether she is female, given she's got what looks down here like could be a beard or a tattoo. And then the rendering of her um, eye, her unibrow, that's a very Near Eastern way to render an eyebrow. So there might be some Near Eastern influences coming in. 
Anyway, she would have been placed in a back room with a holy of holies and offerings would have been given to her. And a second or double temple was added later. And that second temple had more to do with offerings from males and animals and things like chariot groups. Next slide, please. Okay, and these two uh, slides are just to show that we illustrate that we have limited geography um, in terms of the Linear B tablets. Um, this is Knossos up at top, but we have the word for Festos, which is Paito, um, the word for Pilos, which is Puro, which is at the bottom, um, Konoso or Knossos, and Turisa, which is Tilosos, an area of very powerful villas to the south and east of Knossos. We have more than this, but this is just to give you an overview. Okay, next slide, please. Um, recent, we're still finding important things, and this is just an example of one of them. You all may or may not be familiar with the temple of the, I mean, the tomb of the warrior griffin or the griffin warrior that was recently found in pylos and this tomb is a type of shaft grave which you see on the lower left and it was crammed full in, with the warrior uh the griffin warrior but also lots of jewelry mirrors um bracelets weapons um rings he's named for the um carnelian seal at the top left which depicts a griffin but since then they found four gold rings with him rendered in a minoan style and i, I kind of wish they'd change his name to the lord of the rings but uh who knows maybe they will um but th they're still excavating this tomb after several years because they're taking everything out very carefully and studying it so it should pr provide some really exciting new information about what's going on in Pylos. And I expect that this is fairly early, prior to the time of the Mycenaean palaces, maybe overlapping with the time of the Minoan palaces. And it's not clear if he's some kind of young noble who attained these gifts from the Minoans, or if he actually was in fact a warrior. Now there's a way you can determine if somebody's a warrior that I recently uh, learned about. And to do that, you study their arm muscles you look where their arm muscles connected to the shoulder sockets. And if you have a thickening there, the person had been training since a child to learn the ways of the warrior. But if you have a body and it's buried with weapons and they aren't really show this evidence of training, it was just a nice gift. But this is something important that's starting to come out now in archaeology. Next slide, please. Um, this is just to mention the, the tombs they buried the elites in, um, Tholos tombs. Tholos means round. This is the so-called treasury of Atreus at Mycenae because when it was found, they didn't realize a tomb. They thought it must have to be a treasure house. And it's built using enormous stone blocks, including this enormous lintel block that exceeds structural requirements. And then you have what's known as a relieving triangle uh, above it, and that's to keep the downward pressure of the upper layers of stone from crushing the block. You have a similar um, way of building in the um, burial chambers in the Egyptian pyramids. You also have a similar technique for building with the famous Lion Gate at Mycenae. And so this is a technique to keep from, um, to, to maintain the stability of the stone. And this um, dome is made in a technique known as corbelling. And what that means is each successive layer of stone is pushed in a little further until they meet at the very top. And you had some enormous stone blocks making up this tomb. And uh, Joseph Moran, who excavates at Tiran's, has suggested that um, dragging these big stones through the hinterland would have served as a type of performative activity advertising the power of the king. Next slide, please. Now, th 
what makes all this wealth possible that the Mycenaeans had and before them, the Minoans was trade, maritime trade. Um, maritime trade really starts off in the Aegean in uh, the late Neolithic or early Calcolithic around 3000 BCE. But at that time, people are moving around in log boats. It's not so efficient, but they're going after metals because in a sense, metals are the most important commodity. They make the world go round because they make it possible to make tools and weapons. Now, by around 1900 BCE, the Minoans acquire um, the deep hulled ship with mast from the Near East. And for them, this shrinks maritime space and brings them within the trading networks of the Near Eastern, other Near Eastern civilizations. And so they were able, is there a question? Okay. They were able to move much more quickly, collapse maritime space and acquire more intensive amounts of trade. And they were, if the Minoans were pretty poor in raw material, but what they had to trade were finished products. In this way, they were a lot like the Sumerians who also were poor in raw materials, but were great artisans. They also had cloth to trade and also workmanship. Every now and then they would send some of their skilled fresco painters to sites in the Near East, in Israel, in um, Al-Alakh, at Katna in Syria, at Mari, and in Akhenaten's capital at Akhenaten and at Tel Daba in the Nile Delta to execute a work of Minoan art. And this was a very clever way of giving a gift because if you had these workers laying around, you had to feed them. So this way you could send them to a royal court to execute a great work of art that would be exotic and prestigious, and the other place would have to feed them. Um, so you have, besides imported metals and uh, imported works of art, uh, other things were moving around, such as um, raw materials, um, exotic worked materials, um, prestige goods, some in the form of decorated pottery, often holding perfumed oil, um, glass, faience, um, whatever you could cram into the ship. And these ships often traveled in sort of a circular fashion, hugging the coastline in the Mediterranean, but they also branched out into different areas. And you have trade going as far as from um, Cyprus to Sardinia at this time. And it's not sure what was going on, what the reason for it was, because both Cyprus and Sardinia were rich with um copper. However, Sardinia might have been getting um, tin from the Balearic Islands, which would have made it important for creating true tin bronze. And at the same time, the Cypriots might have been sharing some of their uh, te technology um, with these peoples. So you had quite a bit of movement. You would have probably had, um, I just read an article today about a ship that was uh, rescued that had people speaking all sorts of different languages. And this would not be unusual. You probably would have people getting off, getting on. Um, if a ship was a pirate ship and captured another ship, they might split apart where you had um, different groups leaving the first ship and going to take over the second ship. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, this is from the very famous shipwreck off the southern coast of Turkey, known as the Ulu Barun wreck. It had, in addition to having a lot of goods I've already mentioned on board, it had 300 copper oxide ingots. And here you can see them in C2, just the way they would have fallen and fallen in stacks on top of each other. And it could be estimated that this was enough copper to make 20,000 uh, bronze swords. That doesn't mean that's all they were going to make with it, but it sort of indicates the value of a great um, a great hoard like this. And it would have had to have equaled, like say, losing that metal would have had to have equaled a 1,000 point drop in the stock market because it would have been a huge loss. 
So metals seem to be um, one of the main media of exchange. I also believe spices were also bolts of cloth and things, but things like spices, beads, and small objects could be easily carried on a ship and sold on the side. Next slide, please. Now, as these different rulers from Egypt, Cyprus, Sardinia, Mycenae, Anatolia were interacting with each other, they started to establish diplomatic relations and refer to each other as an elite brotherhood of kings. And to sort of show their prestige to their retinues, they collected small objects made in precious materials, but rendered in an international style. So they could sort of show these off to their other great kings. I like to call them as memberships cards in Club East Med. And an example of this is this um, ivory conical riton on the right. And a conical riton is a um, vessel type that we tend to associate with Greece, where it's usually made out of ceramic, but this is carved out of ivory and it was found in Cyprus. And then the ivory box on the top was found in Enkemi on Cyprus, but it shows animals with their legs outstretched in both directions. This is a form of style of gallop called the flying gallop attitude, which was developed by the Minoans about a thousand years earlier. And then you have a faience head cup that seems to be favored by the Cypriots and the Canaanites, but you had similar animal head cups carved out of stone um, of bull's heads that the Minoans favored. And then you have this gold ring, which is one of a number of gold seal rings. And it turns up in a later context in a hoard in Tiryns after the palace is destroyed. But this is just to give you an example of how there was this international style. And they also um, talk, different rulers would communicate through a diplomatic language on cuneiform tablets written in Akkadian. Next slide, please. Now, I mentioned the fortification of Mycenaean sites and their building programs and how, um, although the initial fortifications did not uh, fulfill much of a fortification purpose, they were more to show off, to uh, copy the wealth. Perhaps the Mycenaeans were emulating the Hittites that you see in the upper right corner. Both had lion gates, but of different type of rendering. Things seemed to get more, um, more tense in the end of the 13th century. And what happens in the end of the 13th century is the Mycenaeans extend their fortifications and they extend it to bring a water supply within um, the palace area. And this is prior to the destructions of these so-called sea people. And um, you start to have destructions around the end of the 12th century. Again, these destructions are attributed to these mysterious sea people. Um, the term sea people is a modern term that was coined in the 19th century by um, a scholar named Gaston Maspero. What we have are references to a lot of different tribal groups. And I'll say more about them in the moment. But as the Mycenaean citadels were being destroyed, it's likely some of these people, the people that were liberated from having to drag these heavy stones around um, fell in league with various pirate tribes or became, um, or just became bandits. And I mentioned the new type of weapon that came and how it inspired iron technology. Next slide, please. Um, and so you start to have these different ships going around with people um, and they all wear the same set of uniforms sort of uh, it, it goes between having horned helmets and spiky helmets, a round shield, and a spear. And a lot of these styles come from Italy. And we actually have found some uh, um, sea people styles helmets buried in the Greek mainland, um, also depicted on the famous uh, warrior crater from Mycenae. And there are a lot of, there have been a lot of theories in the past for the end of the Bronze Age. Um, it used to be thought that there was a Dorian invasion that swept down from the region of Germany and brought 
whiteness, blonde hair, and blue eyes to the Greeks. Mm. Excuse me. And this has been pretty much um, discarded as an Aryan fantasy. And then you have, there have always been speculations of plague, but if you don't have mass graves and a whole lot of dead people, you don't have a lot of, um, you don't have a lot of evidence for plague. Plus, if everybody's sick, how can they go out and pillage places and cause destruction? Um, and this is where I began to start to think about this, and I'll mention that in a moment. But um, plague was often just sort of thrown in there, but with real no, no real evidence to substantiate it. Um, the same goes for climate change. There's a little bit more evidence for earthquake in that many of the major sites that were destroyed during this era seem to be near earthquake faults. That doesn't mean an earthquake would necessarily destroy these sites. Coming from California, I've lived through two major earthquakes, and some of them can make your house shake like you're rocking on a boat. In other houses, there's no sign at all. So it can be very, it can be very um, precocious. But the thing is, is if you have an earthquake, it might create enough fear and moment of surprise to enable a peasant uprising at where peasants fall in league with the sea people who we've recently interpreted as pirates. Pl Next slide, please. So, and this is the famous warrior creator from Mycenae I've mentioned. You can see like the the guys with horned helmets on my previous slide. You see guys with horned helmets on this slide, care, wearing greaves, carrying round helmets and carrying spears. And on the other side of the helmet, which is rarely shown, you see the guys with spiky heads. Um, and this crater dates to the end of the, of the Bronze Age, the Mycenaean 3C period, after the destruction of the Mycenaean citadels. Also at this time, you have the destruction of several important Cypriot administrative centers. Um, however, the religious centers seem to get left alone. The main trading city on Ugarit is destroyed. Troy is destroyed. Um, Hatsusas is destroyed. And before this happens, uh, the king Supli the Yumas dies from plague. And then you have some incursions into Canaan. And th this is, I, th again, this is the era of the Trojan War. And as Westerners, because of the Homeric myths, we tend to fixate on the importance of Troy in the Trojan War. Troy had an important strategic um, location in that it blocked the straits to the Dardanelles leading from the Aegean Sea to the Black Sea. But what happened to Troy was just a small part of what was happening throughout the entire region. And during this time, some of these tribes of sea peoples, these various groups and boats, they tried to attack the Nile Delta and this is another sort of piece of evidence that they were pirates in that pirates are rarely successful when they engage in direct combat. They're better at hit and run tactics like uh, burning, burning villages at night, taking lone boats by surprise. Anyway, they desolated the coast of Crete and most of the people on Crete moved to mountaintop um, moved to mountaintop refuges. And at this time, a lot of the material culture changes. Next slide, please. Um, it has been argued that Mycenaean um, art or artistic depictions tend to focus on agonistic activities. By that, I mean military and warrior um, decorations in contrast to uh, the Minoans who are always portrayed doing sort of more peaceful endeavors, but not always. Um, and this is just to show, this is actually one of those round metal helmets found it on the, on the left center, found at the site of Portez um, near Arcadia. And it's the first one of these sea people helmets that's been found. And then what I'm modeling is a set of ceremonial armor. It wouldn't have probably been used for fighting because it was very clunky. All the weight held on the shoulders and if you fell down, you couldn't get up. And something else that's interesting with, of it, with it, about it is that the helmet is a boar's tusk helmet, the type of helmets mentioned in Iliad. However, after the destruction of the Mycenaean palaces, you no longer see boar's tusk helmets. You only see these feathered helmets with a metal band going around the head or these 
horned helmets like you see um, on the on the uh, on the warrior crater. Next slide, please. And here you've got you know, some Mycenaean three C shirts um, showing like fighting activities. And the argument we made for having pirates at this time is that you have suitable geography in terms of um, pirates like to attack at choke points where ships would have to spread out. They like to settle on promontories where they could have a good look at prey. And they also like to settle in uh, river valleys where they could hide and maybe repair their ships. Um, they pretty much lived on a shipborne culture, but in the Bronze Age, people couldn't sail year round. There was a um, sailing season lasted until from April to October, and then there was a planting season. Um, but so they may have planted the winter and sailed and plundered in the summer. We know the Vikings did this. And when they did this, they would have gone pillaging, not for not for gold so much, but for things they could use. If the, gold's, the use of gold to them would so, solely be to get food and boats and other things that they needed. And as they as they fought, they would have attracted followers and captured ships. Now, a, a, a pirate ship operates differently than, let's say, a Navy ship did. On a Navy ship that's run by a government, let's say in the 18th century Atlantic, the British only gave them enough rum to make them happy. They made the, the crew very small so they wouldn't have to pay them extra. On pirate ships, you had as many people as you want, and they shared everything so they ate better and they're, um, they had less work to do. But be that as it may, it's kind of like, they're kind of like hunter-gatherers of the water in that when you have hunter-gatherer tribes um, roaming through Africa or North America and the tribe becomes too big or maybe there's a disagreement, they will fission off. And it seems that this would have been the case with pirate boats as well. Next slide, please. We're getting the plague. And this is just a couple of examples of sea people ships on the left um, from the Medinet Habu reliefs on the right uh, from a stirrup jar, which is a Mycenaean style jar from the island of Keros. Although I've been told more recently, the ship on the Mycenaean stirrup jar is actually a Sardinian ship. And Sardinian ships are very similar in style to uh, Mycenaean galleys. Um, I started also at this time incorporating Canaanite technologies into the ship in that they made what was known as a brailled sail. And that's a sail that could be pulled up and have rings holding the parts of the sail up and it could be maneuvered in multiple directions. And the person who really knows about this idea is Jeffrey Emanuel. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned again, on Crete you had, um, and this is like one of the first sites I worked on Crete as a student, the Minoans left the coastlines and they went to um, mountaintop defensive settlements. There are over a thousand of these defensive settlements on Crete where people moved from the coastline to the mountains and lived where they could sort of be out of sight or out of range of attacking pirate tribes. And they lived in very simple rectangular style, Mycenaean style houses. Next slide, please. And this is just a reconstruction of another one of these settlements at the mountaintop site of Carfi, which is known as the Nail. Next slide. So arguments for plague and textual sources, we don't have a whole lot of direct evidence, but we're getting more. Um, in the Athenian Agora by the ninth century, people were practicing cremation burials. Um, the one you see on the picture is uh, a metal cremation burial with an iron sword wrapped around it. And there's been some speculation that you start to get cremation burials in the Iron Age alongside inhumations because it was a way of dealing with um, people who had died from plague. Um, 
And also there was a depopulation of the land in mainland Greece. That could mean they all die, but it could also mean they just migrated somewhere. Um, and so it's an argument from absence. So you, the evidence we have, you know, these few cremation burials, we don't have mass graves, um, depopulation, cremation burials that accompany inhumations. And we, what we would also expect to see if there were plagues going on, and this is something you see in like the medieval Renaissance period, people actually collapsing dead in their fields. So I had to do a bit of reading outside uh, my area to get some idea of what, like plagues and pirates in different uh, time periods. Next slide, please. Um, much of our evidence for plagues is indirect in that it comes from texts, both historical and mythical. Um, there's a plague god, he's especially important. His name is Nurgle or Era. And the reason why Nurgle is important is he first appears in the Ur III period in Mesopotamia around 2900 BCE. And he continues to be venerated and written about until the seventh century BCE. So he's around a good 2200 years. And he was known from Turkey to Tel El Amarna in Egypt, which is the city of Akhenaten. And so for a, a plague god to have that much importance means that there must have been plague. Um, we also know that, um, and there are other myths of Nergal. He's often also referred to as Era. It's thought that the Hittites called him Aplu from which Apollo came. And a lot of these plague deities are not just deities of plague. They're also healing deities. So I guess you needed to be sure you're on their good side. And Klein 2020 talks about a Hittite plague of the 14th century that killed the king Supuliumas, and I believe it killed his son as well. And at the time this happened, there were Egyptian prisoners. And this starts to bring on another association that are made with plagues, and that is outsiders, sometimes outsiders who become scapegoats. And I'll say more about that in a second. Um, I just want to point out on here, on the right is an amulet against uh, plague. In the middle is a, a stone bowl dedicated to Nurgle. And on the left is a tablet that I'm going to be writing about in an article I'm working on right now. It's one of the 300 Amarna tablets, which were diplomatic texts. And it's remarkable because it, it's written in cuneiform, but it comes from the king of Cyprus. And it's sent to the king of... Um, King Akhenaten, Ak and he talks about how his shipment of copper to the king is late because his workers were gripped by the hand of Nurgle. That is, they were all sick. And it's unusual because we're hearing about a Mesopotamian plague god in Cyprus. Um, they're writing in Akkadian, which was the diplomatic language of the era, but the Cypriots had their own Cypro Minoan system that came from Minoan Linear A. And it was debated for a long time as to whether or not Alashia and Cyprus were the same place. And some Israeli scientists actually did a sample of the clay from this tablet and have determined that it was actually indeed found on Cyprus in the area near where there's a big monumental building called Alisa Paleo Taverna. And that this was the sort of um, route coming from the copper mines in the Trodos Mountains to the sea. So it's quite an exciting piece of information. Um, and one thing to remember with plagues, plagues in ancient times were not always conceived of the way we do. So when they say there were plagues, maybe some of them were viral plagues, but others were not. For example, you have in the Bible talking about the plague of locusts or the plague of frogs. So it could be any sort of misfortune that seems to come out of nowhere. So it referred to sickness, but it also referred to other kinds of misfortune. Next slide, please. Um, and the Egyptians also had their own um, plagues, plague goddess, Sekhmet. She's portrayed here more like a cartoon, but this is on my dig t-shirt from Israel. And she's an Egyptian plague deity. Um, 
with the head of a lion and the body of a woman. And I mentioned biblical plagues affecting Egypt in the Exodus, which is a story for which no evidence exists. But there's um, a Greek um, ethnobotanist whose work I'm using, but I can't pronounce her name. It's very long. And she's done some very careful um, uh, paleobotanical studies of the grain from Amarna and has been determined that certain fleas came uh, into this into this um, grain. And these fleas would have come on black rats that originate in India. Now, how do they get from India to Egypt? Well, it's thought that they came through indirect trade up the Red Sea. So we're starting to get a bigger and better picture of how viral plague moved. Um, next slide, please. And we know of some other famous plagues in history, um, the Homeric plague in the Iliad, um, where Phoebus Apollo uh, punishes um, punishes uh, for the uh, punishes Agamemnon for the um, abduction of Croesus, and we know of Thucydides the Peloponnesian War plague that killed Pericles. And in, in terms of the plague of Athens, it was noted that there were Spartan prisoners there as well as um, some African Egyptians. So again, you have this um, sort of loose connection between the appearance of outsiders and plague. Next slide, please. We're almost done. Um, so we get most of our, our information from texts that are historical and mythical. But we're starting to really get more information now to from um, paleoethnobotany. And um, there's also in the Bible a biblical plague of the Philistines that's mentioned, um, where they had boobubs uh, on their body. And they, and this is because they ran away with the Ark of the Covenant or something. Um, the, the thing is, we have no archaeological evidence that a plague ever hit the Philistines at this time because they were doing quite well. However, what we can learn from this entire survey is that plagues existed from time to time. Um, they often appear in, uh, in concert or at the same time as unwelcome outsiders. For example, the Philistines were unwelcome outsiders. So were the Spartans in Athens. Um, in, in 19, it gets worse, in 1349, Thousands of Jews are executed in Europe because of a plague, and they were blamed on making, uh, turning the water bad. And so there's this association between outsiders, plague, and vermin. And it's really not the outsider's fault, but the thing is, when you have globalization, you have ships, and you have maritime trade, things that come in on maritime trade are not just outsiders but also rats and fleas. And it's interesting that in Venice, um, Venice managed to keep its economy open, but they did this with a very strict quarantine system. In fact, our word for quarantine comes from Venetian quarantini, which means 40. And they would require um, merchants coming to Venice to be in these quarantine hotels for 40 days. And they, right outside the hotel, they would um, erect a hangman's noose as a reminder of what would happen if they try to leave. Um, so this whole idea of mitigation has been going on for quite some time, but also scapegoating migrants as people coming from elsewhere that are, are somehow a type of threat. Next slide, please. And this is actually on the Ula Barun ship where we got all this copper ingots. They actually found a mouse jaw and this mouse could have also um, been carrying fleas and plague. So when you look at what I did with looking at COVID-19 was to look at um, plague, not as something that created an ultimate collapse, but something that um, was a contributing factor to the contraction of economies. And the places that seem to be most affected by plague are trade hubs. For example, maritime ports, boats. 
transportation hubs. Both Wuhan is a market center and a transportation hub. As a result of these things, trade falls. New York City that got hit very badly in the beginning is also um, a transportation hub. And it's, you have people in close quarters traveling by planes and subways. Also, ships and caravans are moving germs and vermin throughout the uh, Near East, especially when you think of things like the caravanserai routes that were bringing things from the south, spices and so forth, that would have made it up to the shore and then gotten put on another ship. Um, so it's transport. as long as we are going to trade and interact with other people and travel, um, plague is kind of an unwanted stowaway uh, for us. I think it's the last slide or next last slide. And just again, to show these trade and transportation hubs, um, how people got along and, um, you know, the Ula Baroon shipwreck was, you know, it was a, a fine example of this. You had ships and caravans and they would have been moving germs and vermin um, in the past as well as in the present from hub to hub to hub. It's like a lot of people think of islands as sort of this pristine environment, but in fact, island and coastal areas were in more intense contact than anywhere. And this created a great recipe uh, for plagues to spread if people weren't careful. Next slide, please. And so you could say ships plus trade bring in outsiders, outsiders bring in plague, and plague is brought by vermin. And that things haven't really changed too much, I think, in about uh, 6,000 years. So let's go to the next slide. And the place, the places that seem to be the last that hit by trade are the more rural areas, the places that are more open spaces. Although if it spreads bad enough, like it has in the US, those places get hit too. But if you're out living out in the, in the hinterland, like you have Bedouin shepherds here on the right and on the left, these are people living in Appalachia, which is a pretty poor area. But if you have um, sort of people living on the margins uh, are going to survive a lot better in, in an instance like this. Um, but you do have food production workers too that live in crowded conditions. And this can be another driver of plague. Um, food producers in a way are more important than skilled crafters because at the end of the day, it may be more important to have a bowl of porridge than an ivory bowl. And um, these essential workers who are food producers often live in crowded conditions and have less hygiene. And it's really, it really behooves us to make sure these people are taken care of because a chain is only as weak, as strong as its weakest link. And if you had people getting really sick at certain times, that would um, lead the irrigation systems to sort of fill up and weaken. Um, and so you have to, the other flip coin of this, all this urbanism, the flip side is the, the more rural countryside where you have maybe a more, um, a more slow life. Okay, final slide. These are just some books I read to influence my putting together a lot of these ideas. Um, one is 1177 by Eric Klein. It's a great book that deals with the collapse of the Bronze Age. Another one, Black Ships and Sea Raiders by a colleague, Jeff Emanuel, which is great on ships. The Great Leveler by Walter Scheidel. He's actually a Roman historian, but he talks a lot about the history of how wealth is built up and then wealth is lost and plagues play a big part of that. And then World Archaeology is where I have one of my we have four pirate article published, articles published, and one of them is in there. Another one, um, this book, Rahm Emanuel. I'm not a big fan of Rahm Emanuel, but he talks about the nation city and how cities are once again becoming the places where everybody congregates. And it's almost like we're returning. It almost feels to me like we're returning to the days of the great Bronze Age city-states, except with modern transportation and nation states that sort of rule over them. But people are again congregating in cities. And this is just a cool book on geography, Earning the Rockies, which talks about 
how America was advantaged by um, its unusual geography. Geography anywhere becomes really important for understanding what's going on. And then Hillbilly Elegy, which talks about the Ozarks and the people, I suppose here you can call them bogans, but uh, in the U.S. we call them the hillbillies and uh, how they lived and were relatively untouched, but also they live at a very low economic level. And then, of course, Belt and Road, the China trying to uh, reinitialize its Belt and Road initiative, but how that will bring trade in. And then also there's a um, there's a podcast on pandemic that I've picked up a lot of useful information from. Okay, that's it. Sorry to sort of have it go late with the, um, you can press the buttons, these float around. Oh, maybe not. Um, sorry to uh, get the late start with the, um, with the setup, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't ease it um, better, but thank you so much, um, Louise, for that really interesting um, and a world <laughs> world covering um, survey of so much that many of us don't uh, don't particularly know or think about enough. Um, it, you said you can play around. I got rid of the last slide too fast. Maybe I can go back to it while people are asking questions. Um, yeah. I, for, I forgot to mention to um, everyone at the beginning, uh, since we kind of rushed into it, that um, I'd be happy for you to put questions in the um, in the uh, chat, or uh, better yet, raise your hand and then come um, come speak to us. I know that um, we had a couple of people who had to go early because they were um, going for too many lectures. There, there was David Lewis was giving a talk um, at five o'clock, so I know we lost one or two people there, and a couple of people have, have dropped out. But um, thank you for coming anyway. Um, do we? I don't see any hands up yet. Um, there are lots of nice thumbs up for the birthday. Happy birthday again to Catherine and to Louise, our speaker. Um, while we're waiting for other people to either add questions to the chat or um, put up their hands, I just wanted to ask a little bit about lessons learned. Do we have any any evidence um, of of you know the especially the plague of, of civilizations having having learned or taught each other you know things that would sort of help them and i almost wonder if um i mean you two words that you used a few times gypsum and copper those are things that respectively have either antimicrobial or anti-vermin properties um that surely the ancients um uh, knew about. I can't think of the actual text myself, but um, and these these are things that obviously associated with the sea peoples as you uh, as you debunk them. Sorry, go. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to know your thoughts. The snakes would be good too, or just to keep the house clean. I was looking at the vermin, um, the vermin invasion up in New South Wales, and now they're poisoning, which are leading dogs being poisoning. But I saw how they used to have this club of guys with with terriers that would go through and eliminate them. But I also think the thing that really came through to me with this is that in absence of a vaccine, um, mitigation, um, separation, uh, separation and distancing are still the best, two of the best things for beating back this plague. And you know, we think it's bad because it's come once in a hundred years, the bubonic plague came two or three times a generation. Wow. And it also though created, it hurt the rich in some ways more than the poor because while all these rich people were dying, they were provisioning various colleges that the poor people were able to go to. And they weren't able to hang on to their serfs, which meant that serfs had more mobility and could command higher wages. So these kinds of tipping points also serve as what we call leveling mechanisms in that they level um, access to wealth out. So there's a lot of different things going on. Even piracy, nothing so much to do with plague, but even piracy tended to move capital around and make it possible for more different areas to build wealth. And this touches a little bit on the issue of migrants. And do we have evidence of 
health migrants, economic migrants, political migrants? All, is there any, any way that we can disambiguate, you know, how, how different groups of migrants are, well, migrating? Or do we like, assume too much? It seemed like different groups of migrating were migrating to, like, uh, become, to do work in textiles or to work the fields or to row or to work in the quarries. But you do, I know in the Roman area, era, you have a lot of um, pref preference for Greek doctors who would have been slaves, but still, but still doctors. Mm -hmm. So coming on their talent, but also, I mean, maybe they came in still as poor, but they were able to work up to being a merchant or something like that, or a diplomat. Um, so there was social mobility. The thing that I, I found that really struck me is like when the virus was going strong last year and um, Trump was referring to urban areas as shithole places and full of vermin. He was drawing a direct line between that and the types of animals that cause plague and the people he didn't like. Mm. Um, we have uh, Aaron Cox has his ha hand up, but, um, and also before that, Barbara Goff put a question in. I'm wondering, Barbara, if you're if if you're willing to to speak to us or able, or should I pass on your question? I can speak. That's fine. I haven't got a great connection uh, currently, but it was just really interesting to hear that those descriptions of pirate ships and of course when you think of pirates you've got like, I don't know Treasure Island or something and also some kind of modern accounts and then also you've got you know Caesar and Pompey and so forth eradicating pirates so I'm just wondering do we see connections between different types of pirate culture across history or is it just a really poor use of the term that we kind of bandy about in different contexts? We do. When I started doing the research on piracy, which is before I got interested in the plague, we're lucky in our history department to have a world expert on pirates. And I took him to coffee and I said, I want to learn about pirates, but I don't want to learn like the anecdotes. I want to learn about their culture. So I was kind of looking for things that would hold true across different time and space in terms of how they form bonds, how they drank for solidarity, how they, um, how they treated each other, um, things like that. So I was looking for pirate culture. And I also looked at, there's a book, if you're interested in class, the classical world, there's a collection of, um, of phrases by Ormerod, and it's all the references to ancient piracy. That said, I would say that the Cilician pirates are anomalous compared to most other groups of pirates because most pirates take um, work during a sailing season and take a period off. And the Cilician pirates were renowned for living in their ships. And there also seemed to be like tens of thousands of them. Whereas most pirates groups, whether it's North, North Atlantic or Barbary or, or sea people tend to just be a few thousand. And also the, the, the pirate cultures are culturally mixed in that, and this is especially evident with the Barbary culture, a lot of Barbary pirate captains were from Britain, but they wore a turban and wore a beard and dressed like an Arab or a Turk. Um, so you can see also that there was this melding of cultures. That's really fascinating. Thanks very much, Louise. You're welcome. Catherine's put more on pirates in the chat, but Aaron, did you want to ask about pirates or something else? Uh, it's uh, along the similar lines. Um, so I was going to ask um, if the, so for example, you brought up the Athenian plague and, you know, that was made so much worse by pulling everybody inside the long walls during that period. And obviously it was quite, quite devastating. Um, is it, you know, is it sort of, well, was perhaps the um, collapse sort of magnified more by, you know, maybe everybody sort of fleeing the sea people, sort of trying to get into the sort of confines of the more fortified palaces? And, it's, you know, we, we, we would need to find the bodies or a mass grave to know. But um, I mean, what, the point you make, though, about the Athenian ones is, it's certainly spot on. If they were spreading themselves out, 
they would have been better off for sure. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Catherine, did you want to turn on your video audio and ask your question, or should I do that? There she is. Okay. I don't know. Was it a question? Was it more of a ramble? I was just interested <laughs> in pirate culture and how kind of how you know new culture gets generated in this multicultural kind of community of, of pirates and how it how it gets passed on and transmitted and I suppose I was also wondering you know you talked about how the, the pirates like to harry the coast and kind of settle on promontories and so on I mean what what does anything happen in the longer term in terms of settlement by pirates do we have I mean I, I, the way I put it in the chat was more like what what happens when a pirate wants to retire um uh but yeah um, they usually die they usually died pretty young but they live better than their royal navy counterparts yeah um it seems but um you you're talking about the islands and the promontories and stuff and it's like how they formed a culture it's like i mean first of all a pirate would have to want to join as opposed to run off into the hinterland and you'd have to to be a fighter you had to be skilled and to have the skill to fight that usually started in teenage years and then captains they were the only ones that got typically paid a bit more because they had a bit more skill in terms of leadership and the way they achieve and then the others without skill would have probably been rowers but the way they achieved solidarity would have been through drinking parties um susan sherritt talks about in the iliad drinking is the only thing they do more than fighting um, but it's not just that. You see this in like uh, North Atlantic pirates as well. Um, they like to have a good piss up and eat and be merry. I mean, the whole eat and be merry part is part of piracy. But we also had to be all business when that time came. Um, so they would sort of build their... It's, it's like drinking in ancient times is like the social networking now. But I think drinking is a lot more fun than Facebook. But it was also they'd have rights. There'd be various rites of passage because I don't think you'd be fully trusted in to the pirate crew until you killed somebody. And do you see them as a very, I mean, because of their kind of sea-based nature, a very distinct group from the kind of vagabonds or bandits who would do things like cattle raiding? Because I feel like in the early modern period or, or even, even later in the kind of 18th and 19th centuries, these are seen as kind of similar like land-based outlaws and sea-based outlaws. Well, there's a, book by, there's a good article by Thomas Gallant who does modern Greek studies and he writes on this, how you might be a pirate one day, a bandit next day, or a cattle rustler the next day. And he refers to this as military entrepreneurship. Thank you. I'll look that up. I wanted to ask also about seasons, and you talked about seasons, I think, in the context of sailing seasons, and yep. this is the first time that it made me think about it, that whether there's any synergy between sailing seasons and and the growing seasons, um, I mean, we, you know, we have the difference in the Mediterranean, if you go back to the Homeric hymns, you've got three seasons rather than four and so forth. <laughs> but um, sailing seasons, my understanding was there are two sailing seasons. And, and it, 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 again, your discussion was the first time I saw that, that synergy between, you know, the food, uh, the transport of food and the sailing season. How does that work? And, or I, did, it, did it work differently back then? I took my model from Cyprian Broodbank's book on the Cyclades. Um, I think it was the Cyclades around two uh, in the third millennium. Mm -hmm. And he's got this wheel and part of the wheel is like when you can sail and it, it's like from May to October. And then you can do the normal planting like from October till May. And then there's like funny little things that are in the wheel. Like, you know, like grapes have a certain specific time and, um, Lentils might have a certain specific time and husbandry might have a certain specific time. And so not everybody who plant, not everybody who planted would sail all the time, but some certainly could. 
and would it make a difference in terms of i mean where they went also that we might have i imagine with the with the wine uh, that um i mean there's so much hmm, maybe maybe it's just something that goes more into a greek uh, you know, classical period or whatever but uh, there's so much evidence of people dropping off here there and everywhere that it seems like there would have been a local sailing versus a long distance sailing season yeah season it's like when, when george P bush i mean george bush george bass published the ulu baroon he had this mm. trip route that did this circular route around the mediterranean it kept going and then a few years ago this woman carol bell wrote an article called wheels and Win within wheels and it was looking at trading routes and be that are interior to that like maybe you know a, a boat goes back and forth from Enkemi to lebanon but just back and forth back and forth mm -hmm. and then you have trade routes where cyprus goes all the way to sardinia yet bypasses sicily so you would have had multiple different routes not just one and people might have gotten off and stayed and picked up somebody there's an article bernard knapp wrote where he talks about the difference between real time and cultural time. And he said, even though it might have taken, let's say, three days to go from Crete to Egypt, a person might have gotten off there and stayed for six years. Cool. And uh, I'm not seeing anyone um, actually putting up their hands and asking questions. So I want to uh, invite you to interrupt, turn your video audio on if you have a question, if I'm not seeing it before we we close up. I want to um, share the, um, let's see, the, uh, the remainder of our lecture series. We've got um, Arlene Holmes Henderson coming up, up next um, week, speaking about, um, Gosh, I'm not sure if that's showing up right. Um, collaboration in UK classics education, reflecting on ambitions and realities. And Arlene joined us last week, in fact. So um, it'd be good to have some continuity from our last talk um, too. But just to, just to while we've got you, Louise, I wonder if, um, if you could have any um, words to share with us on a lot of the stuff that you've talked to us about today pirates and um, analogies with, you know, dealing with politics and economics and um, plague, especially through the through the millennia. Um, do you have any perspective on how this material helps us engage more greatly um, with audiences who might not otherwise come to antiquity, classics and antiquity? You mean with the present? Mm, yeah. You know, I see people and they're like so upset, like they're feeling they're having their freedom curtailed because they can't go five kilometers beyond their house and they don't realize that there's this thing they can't see that can kill them. And it's kind of like, you know, have some patience. It's like um, when we had the Spanish flu even a hundred years ago, people couldn't go anywhere, do anything. And we have, you know, it's so lucky we can still be connected by Zoom and by Skype. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm beginning to talk to people who like, they just want to talk on the phone because I've had too many Zoom meetings today. And, uh, but it's it's like, you know, what a great time we, we live in. I wouldn't be able to speak to you here today like this. And I've spoken in Taiwan. It's like, you know, I have some friends, some colleagues, they just kind of shut down and didn't do anything. And I just saw like, wow, look at all the cool stuff I can do. Mm -hmm. So, but I yeah. do work that we're on kind of a tipping point if we don't get this pandemic under control because I gave my professorial lecture two years ago and it's on my pin, pin tweet on Twitter on populism and globalization. And I thought the tipping point would be automation, not plague. But looking at it now, I think we are at a tipping point and people have to really learn to pull together and not be so divided because this is just this is just the first um, this is just the first round. I mean, I just mm -hmm. read yesterday where a um, bunch of coals in New South Wales are turn or or may have been Woolies. They're turning their provision centers. They're automating them, which means mm 
1,300 fewer jobs. And we need to, we need, to, if, if we can work through these, the system can be saved. Collapse is not necessary. I've, I've learned that collapse is not necessarily a bad thing. It is if you're in it, but it's like the collapse of the end of the Bronze Age. You know, we lost all these great city states and palaces, blah, blah, blah. But the resilience that came out of it, we got like the Israelite culture and the Greek polis and the Roman Republic. So, I mean, something always comes afterwards. Hmm. Well, that's a that's a great um, vote of optimism to end on, I think. Um, and I want to, on behalf of all the people who are still participating and dropped in and a few actually contacted me about their inability to um, join us today, but we have recorded this and so we will try to present it later. Um, but on behalf of all of those people, thank you very much, Louise, for joining us and for sharing all of these fascinating thoughts. This is um, something new I'm working on. So every time I get to talk about it, I bring a little more to it. So it's good for me. And can I just ask you, um, one one person put there's a couple of um, hand clappings going on in the in the teams right now. In case you can't see them, one person put into the chat a question about um, if there's a place where we can get any of your other lectures. And you just mentioned the professorial one on Twitter, was it? Yeah, yeah, it's on. It's my pin tweet on Twitter. I didn't put it up on face on to uh, YouTube because. You know, the university was funny about all the non-copyright images. And I've got a short article coming out based on that, too. I've also got a lot of podcasts on the history of ancient of ancient, ancient history and medieval podcast, YouTube podcast. I've got a lot of podcasts. So so if we just look for you on YouTube, we should find lots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. And I've also written about six op-eds on Naos Cosmos this year. Cool. Okay. Um, Neos Cosmos, I, I know, is a is a um, yeah a newspaper in in uh, is it run out of Melbourne? Yeah, it's run out of Melbourne. Yeah, but it's yeah, um yeah. it's gotten really it's gotten really edgy, and I'm not just saying that because I publish, but I I find myself liking a lot of the articles in it much better than um, Fairfax or the Guardian. Cool. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again, and. Um, Go get some sleep if you can. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what drugs and alcohol are for. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, thank okay, you so Thank much. you, it was great. Cheers. My pleasure. Take oh, care. And Catherine has shared your Twitter, um, which is very kind of her. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye.